Anyone who has the dubious pleasure of getting to know me is liable to be asked at some point, Have you ever seen a ghost? It's not to be asked of doctrinaire empiricists, and sometimes I miscalculate. I once pitched an idea for an article about an apparent haunting to an editor I thought I saw eye to eye with. Sorry, he replied, we are a ghost-free zone. I should have guessed, because he's also a humour-free zone. I've never heard from him since. I suppose he assumes I believe in ghosts, which, to his mind, is like believing in fairies. Do I believe in ghosts? I certainly believe in, that is to say, I appreciate, ghost stories, whether avowedly fictional or purportedly factual and in this essay I will be referring to the two more or less interchangeably. The ghost story writer M. R. James said, I am prepared to consider evidence and accept it if it satisfies me. And that goes for me too, and I enjoy considering the evidence. As I say, though, I have to be careful who I ask. In her book Night Visitors, the Rise and Fall of the English Ghost Story, Julia Blackburn writes, Children enjoy a certain amount of pleasurable fear. They love ghost trains, horror comics, Doctor Who, and the taste often survives into maturity. Not in my wife's case. She finds ghostliness depressing because it's adjacent to death, and she finds death depressing. As for my youngest son, I don't think he ever did enjoy pleasurable fear. As a boy, he would never tangle with ghost stories, because he had, still has, I suspect, too vivid an imagination, and they kept him awake. I once left a book of ghost stories in his bedroom, and he didn't want them anywhere near him as he turned in. He got out of bed and gave them back to me. These are yours, I think. On the other hand, I do not want an over-eager response to my question. I don't want to hear, Have I seen a ghost? Yes, lots. The ideal answer is something like, I'm not sure what it means to believe in ghosts. But there was this one occasion. What I like about a ghost story is that there's nowhere for the teller to hide. As L. P. Hartley once wrote, Either it comes off, or it's a flop, and no amount of verbiage can rescue a bad one. The best ones are told reluctantly, on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. The listener's prized rationality is being undermined. It would be bad manners to rub it in. The characters involved in a late 19th century ghost story might be tersely referred to as Mr. Y or Captain D. The narration concludes, there is really no more to tell. Above all, good ghost stories are short. They arose out of an oral tradition, after all, that of medieval balladry. And there aren't many good ghost novels. They are to be told around a blazing fire, and shouldn't still be going on when the fire's gone out. A decent account needn't take any longer than the lugubrious private Fraser took to tell his ghost stories in Dad's army. About two minutes. Any longer, and Captain Mannering would have been obliged to cut him off. Here's one told to me by a woman in a wine bar in Bloomsbury. That sounds louche. I should explain that I did know the woman. She'd been staying at a rented house in Provence with her husband. It was late evening. They'd been downstairs in the dining room and having a row. He left the table and went up to bed. After half an hour or so, she put out the lights and went up to join him. As she climbed up the stairs, she was passed by her husband, who was coming back down the stairs. Since they were not speaking, she didn't ask what he was doing. When she reached the bedroom a couple of seconds later, her husband was sitting up in bed reading. Strictly speaking, she had not seen a ghost, but a fetch, a manifestation of a living person. But that's fine by me. 
The best collection of purportedly true ghost stories that I know is called Phantasms of the Living, and we'll be looking at it in more detail in a subsequent essay. Here is another good, compact ghost story told by Robert Graves in the Christmas 1941 number of Picture Post. He recalled staying in a house at Braintree in Essex that had once belonged to William Benlows, sergeant-at-law in the reign of Queen Mary. The house had what Graves called a bad feng shui. The spare bedroom harboured, as Graves wrote, something that wakes one up with a start at about quarter to two in the morning, the distinct presence of someone, it seems to be a woman, in great terror. Some time after his stay, he wrote, the beams were scraped, and a small piece of parchment was found in a bolt hole. It was a Latin prayer in Tudor handwriting, the conventional charm against evil spirits. Omitis Jesu liberunos. Sweet Jesus, deliver us. One of the virtues of shortness in a ghost story is that there's less danger of the thing unravelling after the climax. In Rudyard Kipling's My Own True Ghost Story, 1888, the narrator rents a room for a night in a bungalow in India. In the small hours, he hears a game of billiards proceeding in the next room, which he knows to be empty. He steals himself to enter the room, and finds that the noise of billiards had been created by a conspiracy of the wind and the rat and the sash and the window bolt. He is disappointed, and he concludes, If I only stopped at the proper time, I could have made anything out of it. I understand his frustration because it was only the wind is not a permissible ghost story conclusion. I myself have experienced what might have gone down as supernatural encounters, but for an unfortunate prolongation of events. I was once walking past Highgate Cemetery at, of course, midnight. A grave had been dug, or somehow worked on, during the day, and a piece of chipboard had been laid over it. As I looked on, this board began to rise up. If I'd fled at that point, I'd have had a story, albeit one necessitating the feeble payoff. I didn't hang around to see what happened next. But I didn't flee, and I saw a fox emerge from the hole. That might qualify as a comedy ghost story, but I don't recognise that as a valid subgenre. The aim of a ghost story is to frighten. Or is that quite the right word? What is the nature of the feeling you should be left with? It is said, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. In My Own True Ghost Story, Rudyard Kipling tried to refine that. The skin of the head tightens, and you can feel a faint, prickly bristling all over the scalp. Or your hair goes white. In a ghost story by Algernon Blackwood, an old lady's wig goes white. Writing of the effect of ghostliness, Robert Graves said, The Greeks had a word for this sort of dread. Panic meaning the fear that suddenly struck them in woods or on hills when the god Pan was about. There is the sense that anything can happen at any time. Everything seems to reinforce your fear. You get into what Charles Dickens, in his story The Haunted House, called a ghostly groove. There is the sense of something brewing up, of what Sheridan Lefanu called, in his short story, An Account of Some Strange Disturbances in Anger Street, a horrid but undefined preparation going forward in some unknown quarter. I know that feeling. When I've overdosed on ghostliness, I don't want to stick my feet out from under my duvet in case something brushes against them, but at the same time, I do want to stick my feet out to see whether something will brush past them. Why? Because the brushing past might not be as bad as the fear of the brushing past. 
I know ghosts don't necessarily appear at the end of one's bed in the small hours. They get about. When I was in the middle of writing a series of novels set in the early twentieth century, I would quite often see Edwardian men in pubs. I'd glance up from my pint, and there'd be a cadaverous-looking man. Very few Edwardians were fat. He'd be wearing a suit and tie, and so he'd be dapper, but also dirty, a very Edwardian combination. Even Edwardian men who were digging holes in the road wore suits and ties. Then he'd smile, revealing black teeth, and that seemed to be the real clincher, because modern dentistry has almost entirely eliminated black teeth. Then he'd get out his mobile phone, and I'd have to conclude that he was just a modern reprobate with a certain Edwardianness about him. I do like to think that time is not an absolute reality, however. Perhaps it is an occupational trait of the historical novelist. When Daphne du Maurier moved to her famous house Menubili in Cornwall, model for the even more famous Mandalay in Rebecca, she learned that it was reputedly haunted by a woman in blue. One day it struck her that she was wearing a blue dress as she typed in her study. Perhaps she herself was the trigger of the legend. She was the ghost, in other words, a projection from the future glimpsed by some passing Victorian. A moment of apparent time slip gives a jolt akin to the more usual sort of slipping. I have a friend who reported a nasty turn on seeing between some modern rooftops the Cutty Sark, which is preserved in a dock at Greenwich. On the subject of ships, I feel uneasy when seeing those photographs of giant liners under construction with small terrace houses of the kind that usually surround docks in the foreground. But this is not a matter of time slip. The ghostly thing is the discrepancy in scale, the apparent wrongness of that object in that place. A homunculus is frightening for this reason. I once had a waking nightmare of a small man scuttling along by the side of my bed. I could just see the top of his head. This is why ventriloquist's dummies are frightening, especially when they are in the guise of a mature man. A great power and capacity for violence is implied by the compression. Daphne du Maurier was on to this as well, hence the unforgettable ending of her short story, and especially the film of that story, Don't Look Now. I've strayed from ghostliness into experiences and sensations analogous to it, but the common element is what I see as a kind of baleful beauty and an opening of the doors of the imagination. One risks fear going beyond the pleasurable, but intimations of immortality provide the compensation. Britain is a ghostly nation. Our leading ghost hunter of recent times, Peter Underwood, died earlier this year, and British ghosts kept him busy. He wrote more than 50 books on the subject. In his A to Z of British Ghosts, he mentions that Breed Place in Sussex was described by the architect Sir Edward Lutyens as the most interesting haunted house in Sussex. I don't suppose anyone was very surprised when, in the course of photographing all of urban Britain, Google Street View captured a ghost minding its own business. It was at Tiger Bay, Cardiff. According to The Sun, the footage appears to show a woman dressed in a long skirt, crisp blouse, bow tie, blue boater hat and scarf, shimmering above the pavement. Edwardian garb, in other words. It's disappointing that she wasn't wearing a tracksuit and walking a pit bull terrier. That would suggest we were still churning out ghosts at the Edwardian rate. But I'm afraid that is not the case. Our ghostliness peaked about a hundred years ago, and I propose to sketch its rise and fall. To begin with, we have the right weather for ghosts. As Peter Davidson writes in 
the idea of North. Ghosts are less a feature of Southern belief than our beliefs in vampires and the evil eye, both of which are direct inheritances from the Romans. But the Revenant narrative is essentially of the North and is the product of occluded weather and broodings on the fate of the dead. As a nation, we were connoisseurs of atmosphere. We particularly liked open fires, whereas our North European neighbours would imprison their fires in iron stoves. The use of the word atmosphere as a literary term comes from the almost palpable atmosphere of Victorian Britain, with its soot-streaked sunsets, which Claude Monet came to London to paint. Charles Dickens was a man for a round of ghost stories by the fire and we've been convening for that purpose for hundreds of years. But the ghosts of medieval folklore were more substantial than their wispy successors. They were often animated corpses, people condemned to purgatorial wanderings, or rudely dragged back to earth in order to answer some pressing question or meet some emotional need. The more fleeting diffuse ghost, so often seen in 19th century Britain, was a product of the Enlightenment. The codification of the laws of nature relegated ghosts to the category of supernatural. Being indeterminate phenomena, they were perceived as insubstantial. The best that could be expected by the Victorian spiritualists was some kind of cloudy wraith or perhaps just a voice, which the sitters strained to hear, above what might be considered the true soundtrack of those gatherings, Matthew Arnold's melancholy, long, withdrawing roar of the Sea of Faith. The fabled question, is there anybody there, was really being directed at God himself. The elusiveness of the quarry only made the ghost hunters more determined. Anyone who owns a biggish Victorian house can be sure a seance would have occurred in one of its rooms, and probably more than one seance. Because if a sitting produced no results, well, that was just like seeing a nil-nil draw at football, or a cricket match rained off. It didn't mean you wouldn't try again. The word spiritualism will be found in the index of almost any eminent Victorian. The names of the leading spiritualists, the actual mediums, have generally not survived. I don't think many people today have heard of Daniel Douglas Hume, even if they find his name vaguely familiar, and he was indeed an illegitimate product of the family that would produce the Prime Minister, Alec Douglas Hume. Daniel Douglas Hume was born in Scotland in 1833, but raised by an aunt in Connecticut after his mother died. He said that his cradle had rocked itself. Soon other people began to believe such things about him. He returned to Britain in 1855, taking up residence in Cox's Hotel, Jermyn Street, and beginning his career as a physical medium. That is, the spirit did not manifest in a straightforward way, but enabled Hume to do, well, the kinds of things a skilled magician would do. Disembodied hands appeared. Musical instruments were played invisibly. Hume elongated himself by up to ten inches. A hundred members of Victorian high society attested in writing to having seen him levitate. The Society for Psychical Research was established in 1882 to investigate mediumship. You might say it was a society of sceptics, but it wouldn't have been formed had not the spiritualists been deemed worthy of study. There was a big overlap between the SPR and the British establishment. Arthur Balfour was president of the SPR in 1896. This was no impediment to his becoming Prime Minister in 1902. From 1875 he'd been holding séances at his house, 
for Carlton Gardens SW1. His diary records that at the height of the constitutional crisis of 1911, when he was leader of the opposition, Mrs. B came to dinner at Carlton Gardens to talk occult with Gerald and me. Gerald was his brother, also a president of the SPR. The history of the SPR also shows the entanglement of British scientists with ghost hunting. SPR member Sir William Crookes, who in 1861 discovered the chemical element thallium, gave the mediumship of Douglas Hume the stamp of approval after a scientific appraisal. Many in the SPR had a soft spot for Hume, but Crookes went further out on a limb by endorsing the much crasser Florence Cook. She manifested a spirit called Katie King, who did look similar to Florence, probably because she was Florence, who, in the darkness of the seance room, escaped the cabinet in which she was supposedly confined and sometimes tied up. There was never any shortage of Victorian gentlemen willing to tie Florence up. Although a married man, Crooks moved Florence Cook into his house, where he took fifty-five photographs of Katie King. And so, in a way, he entered a ménage à trois with a woman and a female ghost. None of this stopped Crooks from being knighted or from being given the Order of Merit in 1910. Crooks was important in the development of radio. In his book Signor Marconi's Magic Box, Gavin Waitman writes, Crooks had predicted with remarkable foresight the development of wireless telegraphy. Another SPR member, Oliver Lodge, is described by Waitman as a distinguished rival of Marconi, and Lodge himself might have been the begetter of radio had he not been distracted by spiritualism. Lodge published a book called Raymond or Life After Death about his conversations with his dead son. Spiritualism was analogous to radio in that it was a new form of what could be regarded as ethereal communication over a long distance a particularly long distance in the case of spiritualism. The telegram and the telephone also had psychic counterparts in the notion of telepathy, unspoken communication between minds. The idea would be pursued by men at the very heart of the British intellectual establishment. They were based at that unofficial annex of the SPR's London HQ, Trinity College, Cambridge. As conceived by most of its adherents, telepathy represented a lowering of ambitions. Attempted communication with the definitely dead had produced too many embarrassing scenes, but telepathy served the goal of blurring the line between life and death in a more modest way, since it might occur between the living and those on the point of death. Many spiritualist mediums disgraced themselves during the Great War by exploiting the bereaved. Thereafter, spiritualism was usually seen as tawdry. In the film of 1938, London Belongs to Me, Alistair Sim plays a spiritualist medium called Mr. Squales. His hair is dyed, and the lobster paste sandwiches served at his seances are really just fish paste. He is reported on by an official of a psychic society. The facial features shown in what he said was an astral projection of the late Lord Birkenhead turned out to be those of a well-known professional footballer. The Society for Psychical Research survives, and the emphasis continues to be on parapsychology. It remains a serious society, with libraries in the plural. Aspirant members fill out an online form, and the first options under title are still Doctor and Professor. Membership is at a creditable 900 or so, but it was 1500 in its late Victorian heyday. The list of recent past presidents includes many academics, but no prime ministers. The College of Psychic Studies 
founded a year later in 1884 by the Central Association of Spiritualists, wears a more New Age aspect and is booming. Psychic studies have come a long way since the college first formed, is the problematic claim of its literature. The talk is of meditation, mindfulness, healing. Photographs of the Victorian mediums are kept in the basement. The same scene, the opposite, you might say, of a tableau vivant, recurs many times. A potted plant, a medium, slumped in the dark with the effort of having elicited a manifestation in the form, perhaps, of a face, apparently floating and swathed about with white cloth. Mediumship survives at the college, but the quarry is spirit in general, rather than the personalised spirit of Uncle Fred. Consultations, as they are called, are held behind closed doors marked Do Not Disturb, which is unfortunate for those of us who would rather like to be disturbed. The ghost trail, in short, has gone cold. Unless, returning to the connection between ghosts and technology, we are all to become ghosts in the machine. In his book, The Immortality Commission, John Gray traces a line between the SPR men of the late 19th century, some of whom believed that telepathy might lead humans to immortality as inhabitants of a realm of pure thought, and modern-day scientists like Ray Kurzweil. Kurzweil is a proponent of the singularity, whereby humans will merge with computational devices and so become immortal. He is alleged to eat 150 pills a day in the hope of surviving until that evolutionary leap is achieved. Kurzweil is American, born in New York, and I suppose it is only fitting that the great aim of transcending death should have been passed from a 19th century superpower to its modern-day successor. This essay is about the relationship between fictional ghost stories and purportedly true ones. Some listeners may think there is no difference, on the grounds that ghosts don't exist. But they would have to agree there is a difference between accounts of ghosts labelled under fiction and those under non-fiction, although the two are entangled. Fictional ghost stories usually strive to appear factual. A short story by Daniel Defoe, entitled With Deliberate Artlessness, a true relation of the apparition of one Mrs. Veal the next day after her death to one Mrs. Bargrove at Canterbury, the 8th of September, 1705, is considered the first modern ghost story, in that it accepts that the reader might need convincing. So the narrator begins by vouching for the reputation of Mrs. Veal. Ghosts were ceasing to be natural and becoming supernatural, hence the need for reliable witnesses. The ghosts of medieval folklore were more solid, and they served the solid purpose of pointing a moral. The ghost might identify a murderer, for instance, as in The Nun's Priest's Tale by Chaucer. The main moral question in relation to supposedly true modern ghost stories is whether they actually are true. Unfortunately, the tellers are often unconsciously peddling folklore. Let's travel to number 50 Barclay Square in Mayfair. Today, that is just as luxurious a property as you'd expect from the address. But it was semi-derelict in the mid-19th century, so qualifying as what Charles Dickens called an avoided house. In December 1880, a letter about the house was published in the journal Notes and Queries. It alleged that the former inhabitants had rushed upstairs to find a housemaid having convulsions while staring fixedly at a certain corner of the ceiling. A few days later, a gung-ho young man insisted on sleeping in the same room. After ringing the alarm bell furiously, he had previously pooh-poohed the idea that he might so much as tinkle on it to summon assistance, he was discovered 
in the same attitude as the maid. He would never speak of what he saw. This is suspiciously similar to the plot of a ghost story by Rhoda Broughton, The Truth, The Whole Truth, and Nothing But the Truth, first published in 1868, in which the maid screams, Oh my God, I have seen it! That is also set in a house in Mayfair. The only real difference is that the bold young man who goes jumping up the stairs three steps at a time and humming a tune dies. Broughton's fictional story is a bit too pat to be good, and the supposedly true one is a bit too pat to be believable. Supposedly true ghost stories are more plausible if they are not pat, if they don't meet the requirements of fiction, being too short, for instance, or too strange. Charles Dickens once had a dream in which an attractive female stranger in a red cloak turned quickly towards him and said, I am Miss Napier. That very thing happened to Dickens the next day. To my mind, that's a good ghost story, in the widest sense of the term. I mean, you spend longer thinking about it than you did reading it. Dickens said of the supernatural, I have always had a strong interest in the subject, and never knowingly lose an opportunity of pursuing it. The same went for many of his literary peers. In her book Night Visitors, Julia Blackburn wrote that the high watermark of the ghost story was 1850 to 1930. In my previous essay, I discussed the concentration of ghostliness arising from the religious crisis of the mid-nineteenth century. The famous writer of the time who did not dabble in ghost stories was the exception. I'm not sure Anthony Trollope ever did. And would anyone who begs to differ please write to the producer of the essay programme rather than to me? But he certainly attended séances, as did Thackeray, Dickens, George Eliot, Oscar Wilde, Conan Doyle. There were varying degrees of scepticism among them. The highly credulous Arthur Conan Doyle, described by one of his biographers as the missionary-in-chief of world spiritualism, was in a position analogous to that of a sci-fi writer to whom new forms of extraterrestrial life are being disclosed every day. He said he would like to collaborate on a story with the spirits of Dickens and Oscar Wilde. Perhaps he had a ghost story in mind. Actually, Conan Doyle only wrote a handful of fictional ghost stories, presumably believing the truth to be so much stranger than anything fiction could come up with. Dickens was more sceptical, but his fictional ghost stories are so vivid that they must have come from deep within him. In his story, To Be Taken with a Grain of Salt, the narrator is reading of a murder case. The discovery of the body had been made in a bedroom, and when I laid down the paper, I was aware of a flash, rush, flow. I do not know what to call it. No word I can find is satisfactorily descriptive, in which I seemed to see that bedroom passing through my room, like a picture impossibly painted on a running river. To me, that's completely convincing. Perhaps I just mean it's beautiful. Dickens corresponded about the supernatural with another great ghost story writer, Sheridan Le Fanu. His stories, like those of Dickens, transcend the mire of folklore. When Le Fanu chose a transport mode for one of his settings, it wasn't anything to do with a headless horseman. It was a bus. The spirit was an animal, and not one of your generic black dogs, but a green monkey. We might say that a good writer of fictional ghost stories influences the folklore, and a bad one is influenced by it. Le Fanu's story of 1853, an account of some strange disturbances in Ainjar Street, is about what happens when two students rent a very old house with a mysterious saddened air, 
that once belonged to a judge. One of the two, lying in bed at midnight, feels the tableau of horror being somehow mustered. Then a picture suddenly flies up to the window, where it remained fixed, as if by electrical attraction. It is that of a hideous old man in a crimson-flowered silk dressing gown. This, it transpires, is an image of a Judge Horrocks, and a subsequent manifestation occurs in the spot where he hanged himself after a long career as a hanging judge. In 1882, the Society for Psychical Research examined the case of a haunted house belonging to a Mr. X. Z. His full name and the location of the house were not given in the Society's report, which disclosed that Mr. X. Z. had seen the ghost of a malevolent old man in a dressing gown, who was subsequently found to have strangled his wife, then cut his own throat. The ghost was seen at the very spot where the old man had killed himself. This all turned out to be nonsense, in every particular, as the Society admitted in a subsequent report. Nobody mentioned the similarity of Mr. X. Z's house to the one in Ainjar Street. If the SPR people thought about the relationship between factual and fictional ghosts at all, they would probably have assumed that the fiction followed the fact. The case of the self-styled psychic detective Harry Price suggests otherwise. Price can be seen on YouTube in a newsreel from the 1920s. Everything about the clip is profoundly dated. The strained RP of his delivery as he talks about psychic phenomena, the cigarette he smokes while doing so, the grandfather clock that chimes, the fact that he chooses to be filmed in his library of 12,000 volumes. He walks, or rather lurches stiffly, even his walk is dated, over to the shelves and shows us a couple of volumes, accounts of factual hauntings. Price would not like us to think he was a man who had read a lot of fictional ghost stories, yet his researches often echoed such stories. Many of the phenomena recorded by Price at what he called the most haunted house in England, Borley Rectory, had previously appeared in ghost stories. Cold spots and thumps in the night, which are perilously close to things that go bump in the night. In November 1937, Price reported that one of his team of volunteer observers, keeping vigil in the library, heard a faint click and discovered he had been locked in. This happens to two men keeping vigil in a haunted house in a story of 1859 by Edward Bulwer-Lytton, The Haunted and the Haunters. The phenomena recorded by Price also echo factual psychic accounts of an earlier era, and that's less problematic. Price reported from Borley that objects must have flown around corners in order to move from their start to end points. The motion of objects believed to have been thrown by poltergeists has always been described as being slower and more controlled than the laws of physics would allow. An account dating from 1681 of the so-called Tedworth poltergeist reported a thrown bedstead landing as lightly as a lock of wool, and it came to rest immediately, without any rolling or further movement, like a stopped frame of a film. The descriptions of poltergeists are so impressively consistent and so compellingly strange that fiction writers can only tag along. Unfortunately, ghosts in general have not been consistent, which suggests they are creatures of the imagination after all. As mentioned in the second essay in this series, medieval ghosts were animated corpses. By the 19th century, they were ethereal, wispy, their lack of substance reflecting their increasingly tenuous claim to existence. So theatrical ghosts became less corporeal. In Shakespeare's day, an actor would put on a suit of armour to become a ghost. 
In the 19th century, he would wear a white sheet. In M. R. James's ghost story, A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, the ghost actually is an animated bedsheet. In fiction, the nebulous ghost would eventually give way to the subjective ghost, the ghost that may only have been in the eye of the beholder, like the ghosts of the two servants in Henry James's story, The Turn of the Screw, which the haunted governess can never make anyone else see. In fiction, a subjective ghost can work perfectly well, but it is not the same thing if you happen to be a psychic researcher. The subjective ghost is of no use at all to him or her. It is the substitution of mere psychology for what had once been a philosophy. It is the curtain crashing down. In the early evening of May the 8th, 1885, a gardener called Alfred Bard was walking home through a churchyard in Sawston, Cambridgeshire, when he saw one of his former employers, Mrs. de Freville, leaning on the railing surrounding her family tomb, which she often visited. She was dressed, reported Mr. Bard, much as I had usually seen her, in a coal scuttle bonnet, black jacket with a deep crepe and black dress. She was looking full at me. Her face was very white, much whiter than usual. Alfred Bard stumbled slightly, and when he looked up again, Mrs. de Freville was gone. He discovered the next day that she'd died two hours before he'd seen her. In late 1868, a Captain P. was discussing with a lady of his acquaintance the question of making compacts to appear after death. I doubted whether such compacts could be fulfilled. She stoutly maintained they could be. They agreed to make such a compact. Whoever died first would appear to the other. On June 22nd the following year, Captain P. was one of seven men swept overboard from a merchant ship called Edmund Graham when it was running before a heavy gale between the Cape of Good Hope and Australia. He remained stoical in the sea. I gave myself up for lost, and I remember well that I thought of the panorama of their past lives that drowning men are said to see, and I hoped the show would commence. But then he saw a loose rope hanging from the ship, and he hauled himself up on deck. The others drowned. Captain P. did not inform the lady of his acquaintance about the event, but he received a letter from her a few weeks after to say she had seen him in her bedroom on June 22nd. The time coincided with his being in the sea. These cases are chronicled in a 730-page work called Phantasms of the Living, which is the most convincing body of supernatural accounts I have ever read. It was written by three founder members of the Society for Psychical Research, Edmund Gurney, Frederick Myers and Frank Podmore and published in 1888. Essentially, the cases in the book, which are written in smaller type than the surrounding analysis, like the cases in a legal textbook, are examples of telepathy, the supersensory action of one mind on another. The concept had been developed within the SPR as being a more plausible explanation of apparent ghost sightings than the simple reappearance of the dead. The communicated visions described are usually between two living people, but in many cases one of the two is only just alive, or, as in the case of Mrs. de Freville, has recently died. The authors state in their introduction, After considering over 2,000 accounts of experiences that our informants regarded as inexplicable by ordinary laws, we find that more than half of them are narratives of appearances or other impressions coincident either with the death of the person, that is, the person seen, or with some critical moment in his life history. Hence the term 
crisis apparition. The connection of the vision with a death or mortal danger gives a logic to the apparition, whereas the normal sort of ghost sighting might be merely the random and meaningless fictions of an overstimulated eye or brain. The typical apparition will be along the following lines. A man is in his club in London. It is midnight. He is reading a newspaper in the library. He looks up and sees his wife's face at the window. She can't really be there, because the library is on the third story of the building, and anyway, she's at their home in Brighton. He learns the next day that his wife died at midnight. That's a standard scenario, but the book constantly overflows its supposed boundaries. One has the sense of the authors being overwhelmed by their material, and they have to keep refining and subdividing to accommodate the 700 case histories. For example, sometimes the telepathy seems to have been received from a long-dead person, and we are back in the traditional ghost realm. A woman called Mary Ann was lying in bed. She heard a voice calling, Mary Ann, Mary Ann. It sounded like my mother's voice who had been dead two or three years. Mary Ann climbed out of bed and saw smoke on the landing. She walked into her son's room, which was full of smoke, and he quite insensible. He had been smoking a pipe and had fallen asleep after leaving it on a pile of handkerchiefs which had then caught fire. She roused him just in time to save his life. That one is actually categorised under the heading dreams which may reasonably be regarded as telepathic. It is, in addition, a purely auditory, as opposed to a visual case. There are also special sections to accommodate hallucinations seen by more than one person, multiple percipients. And sometimes the hallucination is not of a person, but an object, especially carriages which creates the problem of how an inanimate object could project a telepathic message. Some of the most bizarre accounts fall under this head. A family of three see a closed carriage pulled by two horses rattling up their drive. It appears to be about to crash into a nearby stream. One of them calls out a warning and the carriage stops and somehow turns around in an impossibly narrow space. It then runs over the lawn and comes to a stop. The two men sitting on the box, the driver and his companion, remain absolutely motionless and silent when addressed. One of the three percipients walks up to the carriage and sees through the window a stiff-looking figure sitting up in a corner and draped, apparently from head to foot, in white. The carriage starts up again and rolls away beyond some outbuildings. Another carriage, seen passing in front of another country house, has two footmen standing on the rear step. Both their faces are black. They are not black men. It's just that their faces are somehow blackened. No message is attached to the visions. No news of a specific death or crisis is conveyed by them unless I've missed it in the dense explanatory notes that surround all the cases. The story of Gurney, Myers and Podmore, and the production of Phantasms of the Living, is well told in a book by Trevor H. Hall, The Strange Case of Edmund Gurney. Myers, fellow of Trinity College, poet, parapsychologist, and the dominant figure in the early SPR, recruited Gurney to psychic studies. Gurney, like Myers, was academically brilliant. He was also fated for his personal beauty and the nobility of his character. George Eliot modelled the high-minded Daniel Deronda on Gurney. But he was prone to melancholia, and his unworldly nature made him easily malleable. Myers delegated most of the work on phantasms to Gurney, for whom the book simply had to be a success. He'd had three career false starts 
in music, law and medicine. Whenever it became apparent that the SBR had been duped by some psychic event that was really no such thing, Myers shunted the task of apologising onto Gurney. But there was further ignominy when Phantasms was published. The book was attacked for being a series of anecdotes insufficiently verified. A few weeks later, in June 1888, Gurney was forced to report that the supposed thought transference between the four daughters of a Derbyshire clergyman, the Creary sisters, on which the telepathy thesis had largely rested, had been found to be a fraud. There was one remaining prop for the credibility of phantasms of the living. Apparent demonstrations of thought transference between a group of youths at Brighton. Late on in that month of June 1888, Gurney seems to have discovered that this too was mere charlatanry. He couldn't face writing another retraction. His life's work had come to nothing. On the night of Friday, June 22nd, Gurney checked into the Royal Albion Hotel in Brighton. He was found dead from chloroform poisoning the next afternoon. Frederick Myers died of natural causes in 1901, but he seems to have lived at the centre of a vortex of suicides. He had conducted a three-year affair with his cousin's wife, a medium called Annie Marshall, which ended with her drowning herself in Oldswater in 1876. Late one night in 1910, Frank Podmore, the third author of Phantasms, committed suicide by walking into a pond on a golf course near Malvern. Podmore had recently and abruptly left his job at the post office. He was gay, and there is a suspicion of a sexual scandal, although Podmore too had been accused of being over-credulous about the supernatural, this in spite of having been one of the more rigorous researchers. I do wonder whether the resilience of Podmore and Gurney might have been undermined by inhabiting the unfathomable world of phantasms. A dog appears outside the window of a cottage, but only when another dog in a distant field is barking. When the barking stops, it disappears. Lights appear in innumerable bedrooms at night, usually after a death. When a hand is swept through them, they tend to disperse into multitudes of floating spangles. A dense pillar of what seems like, but is not, black smoke, materialises outside the door of a house on a dark August night. It radiates pure malevolence. A woman wakes at night to find her husband already awake and staring intently, his head propped on his elbow, at a black-clad old woman crouching by the wardrobe. The figure then disappears. A woman who lives in a house by a Scottish river is suddenly observed by her daughter to collapse on the sofa, crying, Oh, there's water rushing fast into my ears. A moment later, the daughter sees beyond the drawing-room window people running very hard towards the bathing place. Her uncle enters the house, very white, and demanding hot blankets. But it is too late. The narrator's brother, eldest son of the lady collapsed on the sofa, had drowned in the river. If any trace of Gurney and Podmore remains in that realm of collective unconscious that Myers in particular was so keen on, then I would like to be able to convey to them, telepathically, that few books have made such a powerful impression on me as phantasms of the living. As to the strict credibility of the cases, perhaps I underestimate the imaginativeness of the percipients, but almost all of them pass what is, for me, the primary test in this area. They seem far too strange to have been invented. York, seven o'clock on a winter's evening. As I walk through the labyrinthine medieval streets, I glimpse, amid the shop workers heading for home and the occasional dazed-looking tourist, a man walking purposefully towards some rendezvous in a black-caped coat and top hat. 
I turn a corner and there's another, similarly dressed, and this one has ensnared a few of the tourists who trail after him. The men are hosts of the York Ghost Walks. There are half a dozen ghost walks in York every night. The hosts have their jealously guarded pitches and roots. If one walk leader encounters another, they don't raise their top hats in friendly greeting, but cut each other dead while continuing to address their own followers, with whom they play it for laughs. The last time I went on one of the ghost walks, the leader began by collecting everyone's money, four pounds apiece from about twenty people. He stowed this in his little Victorian doctor's bag, they tend to carry these, like so many Dr. Jekylls, and promptly disappeared around the corner. He sauntered back ten seconds later. For some of you, he said, that's going to be the biggest fright you'll have all evening. This was certainly right in my case. The walk was genuinely amusing, but as it progressed, I kept thinking of ways in which it could be more frightening. The host talked of a sixteenth-century murder of a young woman that had occurred in a room of a house we were approaching. He indicated the dusty little window. But we barely slowed as we passed by. I'd have had a collaborator in that room, suitably made up and posted behind the window. She would have shown her face, but only belatedly, so that perhaps the last two or three members of the party might have glimpsed it. But our top-hatted host was now leading us towards an Italian restaurant. We were instructed to stand outside its window and make scary ghost faces at the diners. In pretend rage, the manager of the restaurant came out wielding his giant pepper grinder. This exercise in slightly adversarial mock horror reminded me of Trick or Treat. I don't know how profitable the York ghost walks are. They must do well, otherwise there wouldn't be so many of the Dr. Jekylls. But I do know that Britain experienced what was estimated to be its most profitable Halloween ever in 2014. Retailers are forecast to enjoy a £330 million boost from the event once known as All Hallows' Eve, I read last October. According to the analysts at Planet Retail, this represented remarkable growth when compared to the £12 million value of the UK Halloween goods market in 2001. Halloween interests me because it, like the ghost walks of York and the ghost walks of all the other towns that have them, my rule of thumb is that if there's a cathedral there'll be a ghost walk, illustrates the tone of modern British ghostliness. It has turned camp. The disturbing aspect is minimised to the extent that a couple of years ago I saw, on Asda's well-stocked Halloween shelves, a child's grim reaper outfit. One size fits all. The parodic approach has a near universal appeal. It can embrace all ages, and even those of us who find in it a lamentable lack of the strangeness that is surely the hallmark of the supernatural do not object too strongly. When I was a boy, the merry cry of trick or treat was never heard. Back then, Halloween was quite frightening, partly because it was so little observed. There would be the occasional cackling pumpkin face on a windowsill, and I recall glimpsing a young woman in a witch's costume skipping through the middle of York. At that moment, it suddenly seemed right that a witch would skip. As a festival, Halloween was upstaged by two related events of early November. There was Bonfire Night on November the 5th, of course, a much bigger date in the 70s than today. It transpired that all the community organisations, scout troops, resident associations, social clubs, were stuffed with pyromaniacs. In the dark evenings of late October, you'd see middle-aged men carting busted sofas and mattresses towards the mountains of old furniture they intended to burn. There was also, in York and other pockets of the North, Mischief Night on November the 4th, 
when local youths would knock on doors and run away, or possibly drop a banger through the letterbox, because there was a convergence between mischief night and bonfire night, and the scoutmaster had to guard his pile of sofas in case it was torched a night early. York winters, surely, were darker in those days. Less of the city was illuminated, and there must have been a smog problem. I remember being given a fluorescent armband to wear on the sleeve of my duffel coat as I walked to and from school. The turning of the seasons was more palpable. The crack in time, as the folklorists call it, more evident, and there was a sense of malevolent things crawling through that crack. Please leave, we were warned, or reassured, was cancelled on both Mischief Night and Bonfire Night. This was all disentangled for me a few years ago by the folklorist Doc Rowe. He suggested I think of both Halloween and Bonfire Night as part of what was known as Hallowtide, a cluster of customs arising from the Celtic celebration called Sarwin, which marked the coming of winter. Sarwin involved the lighting of fires to honour the dead and defy malevolent spirits. The medieval church considered this diabolic and sought to co-opt the event for Christianity by instituting All Saints Day on November the 1st, on which the sanctified are honoured, and All Souls Day on November the 2nd a more democratic honouring of all Christian souls. Doc Rowe explained that by tarring Halloween with an occult brush, the church made it an occult event. Customs of licensed naughtiness, of misrule or world turned upside down, which had been associated with Hallowtide, were practised with greater relish now that the church had prescribed them. On All Souls Day there was soul-caking. Young lads would knock on wealthier people's doors and offer to say prayers for the departed of the house in return for sweetmeats. The householder might think the callers did not look very pious, what with the great clubs they carried over their shoulders, but he would be well advised to agree to the deal. These traditions were taken to America, by Scottish and Irish emigrants in the 19th century, and they have returned to us in the form of trick or treat. Doc Rowe believed the Americanized trick or treat came over here after the broadcast on BBC Two in 1972 of an episode of a documentary series called Look Stranger. It showed children on the American air base at Woodford in Suffolk doing trick or treat. Within two years, Doc Rowe said, all the tabloids were telling people how to dress up for the occasion. Whereas a modern-day health and safety officer would have been appalled by the old bonfire night, such a person looks with approval on the new Halloween. The children are usually chaperoned by their parents, and they only call on houses where an illuminated pumpkin signifies that the inhabitants will play along. Trick or treat is a purely rhetorical cry. The trick is seldom resorted to, unless we count the very modest scare caused by the sight of ten six-year-olds dressed up as the undead. The only harm that occurs is to the children's teeth, as they consume buckets full of customised sweets, such as trick or treat Jaffa cakes, a ghoulish blend of dark crackly chocolate and light sponge with a scarily zingy orange centre. Halloween is now the biggest seasonal retail opportunity after Christmas, and most ghostly projects fall into its gravitational pull. You've written a collection of ghost stories? Publish them at Halloween. The only other possibility is Christmas. Christmas is the biggest retail opportunity, but its supernatural aspect is not so crassly exploited, unless you count the immortal hero of the piece, Santa himself. The Christmas ghosts are more subtle than those of Halloween, the connection between ghosts and Christmas being more tenuous. 
proverbially, ghosts did not appear on Christmas Eve. Horatio, in Hamlet, says, No spirit can walk abroad in the season wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated. Witches and fairies were also put out of action. But between 1971 and 1978 there was A Ghost Story for Christmas on BBC One. This was my introduction to the work of M. R. James, although my favourite James tale, The Story of a Disappearance and an Appearance, was not one of those filmed. The cumbersome title has the true hallmark of ghostliness, I think, an indecorous, almost violent quality. It features a dreamed Punch and Judy show that begins with the deep tolling of a single bell, after which the curtain flew up. That too is just right. And the drama began. When Punch hits his victims, there is the sound of bones giving way. After the final murder, Punch comes and sits on the footboard and fanned himself, looking at his shoes, which were bloody. A moment later, Mr. Punch is being pursued through woods by a sturdy figure clad in black. His head was covered with a whitish bag. The story for 1976 was The Signalman by Charles Dickens. Dickens coloured in what had been a rather pallid festival. He made Christmas cosy. As Peter Ackroyd wrote in his biography of the man, Dickens's insecure childhood gave him an acute sense of and need for home. He made Christmas cosy in part by making it ghostly. The eponymous functionary of The Signalman, which Dickens published at Christmas 1866, is deeply tormented by his precognition of a train crash. And no wonder, since Dickens had nearly been killed in a train crash the year before. Early on, the narrator calls down from the top of the railway cutting to the signalman. Hello, uh, hello there. Just then there came a vague vibration in the earth and air, quickly changing into a violent pulsation, and an incoming rush that caused me to start back, as though it had force to draw me down. When such vapour as rose to my height from this rapid train had passed me and was skimming away over the landscape, I looked down again and saw him refurling the flag he had shown while the train went by. There's tremendous latent energy in that. I particularly admire the skimming away of the steam. There is nothing camp about this tale. It is full of doom, and I believe it embodies the credo of all of us ghost fanciers. The dead must be present among us, that we might better appreciate our lives. <laughs>